a shame you're not able to to join us in person, but this is the next best thing. This is amazing. Yeah, well, thank you very much for uh, being so accommodating. Um, obviously, we'd love to have been there. We'll have to make sure the plans um, the plan works for next time. Absolutely. Linvoy, tell us a wee bit about your story. Some of us remember you who are old enough uh, playing, <laughs> <laughs> playing for Portsmouth like <laughs> in the Premiership. Might even remember you scoring a goal or two. That's um, right. Usually with your head, I think. Is that right? Yeah, well, if anything went, went near my feet, it never really went where it's supposed to go, so <laughs> my head was a bit more accurate. <laughs> well, I have to say that as far as stopping the ball is concerned, uh, as a defender, you, 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 you've had a magnificent career, have you not? Well, I know yeah, you're not going to say that, but uh, as you reflect on your career, um, tell us a wee bit about how things started and you know how you get into football. Yeah, um, so I think like most children, um, when you when you got an opportunity to to play any sport, uh, you just do it, uh, and, that, and that was <clears throat> what I was like. So I grew up in East London, uh, Stratford, and um, lived in a high rise block of flats. And the opportunity to get out and play never came about too often. So uh, only because of the the, the um, things that were going on around the area that my parents tried to protect me from. So the opportunity to get out and play any sport, I just took it. But football came alive in me when I watched a, a cup final between Tottenham and Manchester City. And the Manchester City, uh, it was a replay, and the Tottenham uh, striker, Ricky Vila, scores this amazing goal. And, I remember uh, it well. Say again? I remember it well. Oh, good, good. Yeah, it's, uh, well, and I suppose cup finals can be built up to, for a lot and not much happens. But this particular one and that goal, I think a lot of people are, will remember it. And uh, and at that moment, he done that. And I thought, well, if he can do it, so can I. And that's where the dream started. And uh, and I, I made my first football pitch in the in my mum and dad's block, of, uh, in the flats, in the, my mum and dad's alley of the, of the, uh, of the house. And... Um, and playing against my teddy bear, so that was where I scored my <laughs> goals. That's where my goal scoring came to life. Um, and then from there, it was a case of trying to place uh, for a team. Uh, I didn't play for a team until I was twelve, and I described it as being a veteran when I started. You know, because no, nowadays you can be five or six and be selected for a, a, a professional club. And um, and then from there, I, I got scouted by Charlton, um, which was amazing because. I just knew that that opportunity to, to be a professional footballer was getting a bit closer. And then at 16, I got offered an apprenticeship, but it wasn't as easy as just turning up, training and playing in those few years. It was a case of, there's not just me wanting to be a professional footballer, there was about 40 other boys and uh, and, and the numbers started to dwindle. And by the end, uh, by the time I got my apprenticeship, there was only five players who, uh, who were still left and I was one of the five. So... Um, that was the moment where it, it came, it came alive, it, it came to reality that I could actually be a professional footballer. Uh, but then the next two years were very difficult, training every day, uh, the physical aspects of it. My body wasn't strong enough going from schoolboy to, to men's football. Um, so I had a lot of injuries and uh, trying to understand the, the, the culture of the dressing room as well. So a lot to learn, you know, and, and I always say I was a boy in a man's world at that point. And, and fast forward to your period at Portsmouth. You obviously were in, with Charlton and a few other teams, yeah. um, but it's probably Portsmouth that you've been particularly um, prolific. And uh, Harry Redknapp was was one of your managers who right. who whose sides you went in and out of. I think didn't you? Yeah. Um, what what was it like? You know, you've really worked hard to get where you are, and yet your manager doesn't necessarily pick you. Yeah. Mm, it's that's one of the difficulties of being a sports person. Um, you know, your performances, your training can be very good. You, the way you look after yourself can be very good. But yet the manager, in his wisdom, decides if you're good enough for the team or, or not. And um, and early on in, when, in my Portsmouth career under Harry, he thought that I wasn't good enough and he was prepared to let me go to another club. Um, so that was difficult. Um, but... In the life of football, you you know that's coming at some point. It's going to come. So, the the, the toughest thing I I think I had from the age of say eighteen to, to twenty eight twenty nine was trying to prove myself every time 
And but I did think to myself, you know what, I'm up for this fight. But I knew I was still tired. I was knew that you do this, you know, and every time a new manager comes in, you're doing it again, and you're doing it again. So, um, but I eventually got myself into that team, and um, you know, had a, an, an amazing time at, with Portsmouth. You know, promotion to the Premier League, playing against some of the best players in the in the in the country in the world. Um, playing alongside some, you know, amazing players, household names that represented their their uh, countries as well. So, you know, in the end, uh, what looked like it was going to be a difficult time, maybe not even being at that club, turned out to be the best spell of football in my career. Mm, and you became a Christian, what, 2001 or, or thereabouts? Yeah, um, that's correct. Can you tell us a bit about that and, and what difference that made to your your playing to your approach, your attitude. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me, becoming a Christian, uh, it was, I thought that being a Christian was just going to church on Sunday and and that's where, it, you know, you stayed and I was going to be a secret Christian. Um, but the whole point of uh, making the decision to becoming a Christian was because I was tired of life. You know, my wife wasn't well. I had everything on paper that said you should be happy and I still wasn't, um, and got invited to church, heard the message about Jesus uh, dying on the cross for me because I, I, I didn't you know, have bad things in my life and uh, to have a relationship with God. And even though I didn't completely understand it, parts of it made sense. And in the end, I just thought, you know what, I do, you know, the, the famous words, take a step of faith. And, um, and, I, and I, like I said at the beginning, I, I thought that would be it. But very quickly, um, it rolled into my football uh, life uh, in terms of I had good people around me uh, who understood the culture of the dressing room, understood the difficulties footballers face, and they were willing to sit with me when I was going through the, the, the difficult times and read the ver Bible with me and show me scriptures that would help me understand who I was and who God and how Jesus saw me. And... Um, and once I started to apply the, the, the Bible verses to the situations I was uh, coming into, um, I, ha I had freedom and I had peace because I realised that I was playing for uh, for one, an audience of one, playing for God, you know, because because at that moment, I at leading up to that point, I thought that I had to please everyone. But if I just played for the one that gave me the gift, um, my life would change and it really did change. And... And like I say, it was um, like the best spell of my, my career. And, and I definitely know accepting Jesus as my saviour was the turning point for me. Mm. So it really freed you as far as being able to play better, probably? Yeah, I think I, the way I describe it, I played with peace. You know, it didn't, I, I care, I really wanted to win games. You know, I, I, was, I was really competitive in everything that I'd done. But the outcome of a result didn't just define who who Linvoy Primus was, and when that when I realised that that the, the Bible verse that really uh, helped me through that those moments was, um, whatever you do in word or deed, do for God, and I, and I was like, what does that mean? And and the chaplain just said, Lynn, just play for God, just play for Him, and I went onto those the pitch, and it's like, God, this is for you, and. All of a sudden, I, I I was running, you know, like Usain Bolt, and I was hitting the ball like Pele. And but they, people were saying, "Limbo, you're different." And I could always turn around and say, "It's because Jesus in my life, and He's given me the freedom and peace to allow me to play like this." And uh, and it helped me play much much better. Mm. And and you mentioned the chaplains there, um, and Matt Baker's with us tonight. Yes, yeah. I'm at <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, and, and chaplains have got alongside you at your clubs, have they, and been able to be a, a support and an encouragement? Oh, yeah, yeah, because one of the things, you know, you, you, you'll understand this, Neil, because you've been around it, uh, players find it hard to trust anybody. Um, you know, within the team environment, you have to look out for number one, Um because if you're not in the team, the likelihood is you're not you're going to lose your contract and all those things. But yet you've got to be part of a team. So if there's stuff going on in your private life that you know you can't share with anybody, who can you share it with? And uh, the chaplain is uh, the constant at a football club. He's the person you can go to to offload, to to get words of wisdom, to 
to get a different perspective on life, but a, a, a place of trust, a, play, a safe place. So um, when, when my relationship started to build with the chaplains at Portsmouth, I knew that I could go to them with anything. But what I was able to do is signpost other players to them as well. Um, and, and, and I saw time and time again how the chaplains really helped a, a lot of players through, through good and bad times. And, and not necessarily people with faith. That's right, yeah. It's, and that's, again, it, it, it's trust. Because when you think about it, you're in a macho environment, you can't show any weakness. But if there's a person there who doesn't care if you're a footballer, just cares for you as a man, uh, that's somebody you can trust and who you can go to. So, yeah, it's, you know, the, the chaplain's not biased in who he speaks to. And, uh, and I think a lot of the players started to recognise that. And and it is a man's world, but it's interesting that that your daughter Atlanta is playing football in in yeah, in the states yeah. at the moment and has played at, at under nineteen England level. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, that's correct. She's the best footballer in the Primus family now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, well, and you know what? Which is great because for there's no restriction. She's played, you know, uh, uh, for three clubs, um, Chelsea being one of them, Yeovil. But what you see in the women's game is that still the the appetite to to, to play the work game well, but fairly. Technically, they they're very gifted. Um, the only thing that I'd say that the, the, there will always be a struggle for the ladies' game is that it will always be eclipsed by the men's game, and and you'll see players coming into it. Who, who'd like to make a career in it, but unfortunately they won't be able to because of the financial side of it as well. So I think you'll see a lot of young players coming in, but I don't think you'll see a lot of players having 10, 15 year careers. And uh, well, we wish we wish Atlanta well and that. Thank you. That makes great. Thank you. Uh, injury is a terrible thing and it's an inevitable affliction in football. Uh, some Some players do survive most of their career without without that uh you know detriment or that hurt to your your game and your your well-being what in your own experience did uh did that feel like you know because you 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 it was injury that stopped your 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 game really wasn't it yeah it was um i was fortunate really i had a number of uh years where i'd have strains and and pulls but i never um the closest i got to breaking anything was a a hairline fracture so I was out for six weeks but I never had anything that um like any impact injuries but it's still a lonely place when you're injured because you know that the thing you you want to do and you you know your the energy in you to get out on that pitch and run around and score or defend whatever it is um you can't do so it can be a, a lonely lonely place um when I I had my injury that ended up stopping me playing. I it, it took. I had two operations and, it, uh, and I missed the season. Uh, two operations on my knee and I ended up missing the season. But in that time, and being a Christian as well, I had a lot of thinking time, a lot of time to understand that God had the plan for my has a plan for my life. And you know, if football ended at that moment after those operations, even though I wasn't totally comfortable with it. I had a thought process, well, there must be something else for me to do. But fortunately, I had another year. Uh, but in that year, I knew I wasn't the same player. So it was like I was deconditioning uh, slowly but surely. So by the time I came to retirement again, because the knee wasn't in a condition to keep playing, I was ready and it was like a big weight off of my shoulders. But I've seen it work the other way for players where they can't cope with it. And um, unfortunately, you know, you, you hear some very sad stories of, um, you know, stuff going on in their private life that you, you, you hope that it will never happen to anyone, but it does. And um, so you, two sides of it are people who prepare for retirement, cope a, a bit better. The ones that don't, they really have a tough time. And, and Envoy, could you tell us a bit about your work now with Christians in Sport and Obviously, your experience in football must give you a, a an insight that, that allows you and enables you to get alongside players. Tell, tell us about what you're doing now. Yeah, so um, I work with Christians in Sport uh, in the capacity where well, there's a performance team uh, who oversee a number of different areas in uh, 
sport and my area is football and I suppose the easiest way to describe it, I, I'm a mentor to players who, uh, who have got a faith in Jesus, uh, people that are searching, or even some of the guys, it's a, again, who haven't got a faith, haven't, you know, not in that p particular space, but uh, a challenge where they are in their life at the moment. Um, so it's really exciting because one of the things you, you learn or you're taught as a, uh, or sorry, you hear from managers is you have to earn the right to play. You know, and that means you might have to have a battle. You might have to before you can play your style of football in a particular game. And um, because of my background of, of, of being in the game for for a while, when I go into any club, because they know that I've played, there's a trust element straight away, and they open up very quickly. Um, so that's really really helpful. But what I've found in the last two or three years is that players. Are very confused about their identity and and to be able to talk through things in in their lives and and relate them to where I was and what I was going through it, it's it's been you've seen a lot of good good things happen but I also recognize that the game is changing you know financially it's changing uh, the demands are different the social media side of it is different so um so yeah it's a, it's something it's nearly like you're learning on your feet because, uh, you know, it's been seven years since I've uh, retired. It's been nine years since I've played 90 minutes uh, at the highest level. So really, I'm like the old granddad when I go <laughs> in. <laughs> <laughs> but I, like I say, because I've got no agenda, because I haven't, you know, most players will see if someone approaches them for some, uh, about anything, they'll, they'll be thinking, what do they want? What do they want from me? So because there's no agenda, um, there's a real openness and and an opportunity to, to get alongside and help them on their journey. Great. And have you ever played with any Scottish footballers? Uh, yes, uh, but it's, you know they're going to be granddads in everyone's eyes, I suppose, because of their <laughs> age. But uh, Robert Fleck, uh, had the pleasure of playing with Robert Fleck. Uh, I was managed by Tommy Burns uh, when I was at Reading, so I had a good time with him and... Um, Trying to think of, did you understand them? Well, it took me a little while, but you know, I got there in the end. <laughs> when he was telling me off, I, I was just smiling, so I was all right. So uh, <laughs> that's but, right, just no idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what was good? It, there was a, a real professionalism that they brought into the dressing room, um, and and because of what they'd achieved in the game, especially obviously Tommy and uh, Packy Bonner as well. You know what they'd achieved. There was a an instant. Wow, you've got to listen to these guys uh, because they they play for great clubs and and uh, represented the country and stuff like that. So um, so it was good to to experience that. Really good to experience that. Mm, excellent. Well, Tommy Burns he managed at Kelly too, which was okay. uh, he's yeah. a bit of a legend yeah. up here with Celtic and Kilmarnock. Yeah. yeah, and and you 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 come you I mean you hope to come up to Scotland as well to be involved in supporting players, don't you? Yes. Yeah, I, I came up. Um, probably about two and a half years ago and I was able to get into Hibs um, and meet a couple of the staff there and uh, and meet some of the younger uh, performance athletes in, who are involved in athletics and football and have a chat with them and I spoke in a couple of churches. So, uh, yeah, it'd be great to get back up and, and I'm sure, you know, two or three times a year I'll be up to... to to work alongside yourself and Mark uh, Fleming. Hi, Mark. I think you're there tonight. <laughs> um, again, to to encourage each other and and just see, you know, be able to find out who the players are and and offer some support in some way to them as well. Yes, fantastic. And you're a, you're a legend at, at Pompey at Portsmouth. Uh, how how have you handled that? Uh, I mean, you're a laid back guy anyway. You pro probably doesn't get to you. Uh, just by nature, but but I imagine handling fame might be quite difficult at times. How, how do you how do you go on with that? Yeah, it's, I think because I, I I've been married to my wife, or well, we've been together twenty six years, and uh, so we've done the journey through that. Uh, you know the ups and downs of what football brings you, and because we've seen the nature of what football can do, it can lift you up and drop you very quickly. We've always 
remind, always said, and we've always spoken it out, that we, we want to keep our feet in the real world, no matter how big um, or how big um, or try to think of the right words here um yeah how big the the primus name gets you know in terms of premier league or international football that in the in the house at home um i'm a husband i'm a dad and we always used to say to the children everybody might want dad's autographs or pictures but when the front door shuts he's your dad you know and uh, so we've always kept it that way and when we started, when the profile started to change, it was difficult for us as a family because, you know, to to go shopping, you know, just go food shopping could, for, you know, for to pick up little bits could take about an hour. Um, so that got me out of shopping, to be fair. I didn't have to go shopping that often. So, <laughs> I, I, I that. <laughs> um, so it could have been difficult, but I think we, friendships, we, we, we try to uh, keep our friendships in a place where, you know, we, we, we were very guarded as well. We didn't allow people into our lives that only wanted to know us because of the, the world of football. Um, so that helped. But, you know, we, we didn't get it right all the time. But and because, of, again, because of being a Christian and understanding, you know, that actually football isn't everything. Uh, but, you know, what Jesus done for me is more important. That in itself kept a, gave, gave a sense of perspective in terms of what fame and and fortune can give you, but actually what Jesus gives you yeah, is much more. I'm sure. Yeah, and, and that's it. And, I, and, I, and my parents, you know, I, I'm so uh, blessed to have parents who never, <clears throat> never sh used to show off about anything. They just get along with and do things. They, you, know, you don't realise how much you learn by just watching, and uh, and they and they help me understand that as well. And um, and don't get me wrong. We've had nice things. We've done. We've been on lovely holidays. But once again, we've tried not to let that be our identity. And um, and yeah, and, and like I said, but we haven't got it right all the time. Hmm. And Lundvoy, just finally, for faith and football tonight, what what message would you like to leave with us? What what thing would you like to especially ensure that we remember from 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 interviewing you? I think one of the, the something I always hold in my heart. I, I chased I chased my dream from the age of eight years old. You know, of being a footballer, and I thought that that would give me the happiness, the joy, um, the rewards that say, "Yeah, your life is going to be perfect." But I, time and time again, I was let down by football. Time and time again, I was let down by. Uh, the things around football um, and it wasn't until somebody spoke to me about Jesus you know 28 years old spoke to my wife and myself about Jesus that it, it not only challenged me but it, it, it started to bring me to a place where I realized there was more to life than football and I'd say anybody in in the room this evening you know, life is going to throw so many things at you, good, bad and ugly, but that's life. But I think the, the big question is, you know, what is life about? And even though, like I said, I took a step of faith in accepting Jesus as my saviour and I took a step of faith of following this Christian uh, life and everything like that. But what I realised by taking that step of faith, by asking lots and lots of questions that things started to make sense. And even though things don't make sense all the time, I've got a hope for my future. And I think that's the, the thing I'd leave any, with everybody. Ask the questions because there's a hope that I want everybody to, to, um, to have. And uh, once you've got that, oh, it's great. It really is. Fantastic. There is hope. There is hope. Fantastic meeting you again tonight, today. Thank tonight. you, Neil. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we wish, wish you and your wife and your family uh, all goes very best. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynn Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you uh, again soon.